Hello, we are Replio, short for Refueling Endeavor for Prolonged Lunar Exploration and Operation. Our project analyzes the refueling architectures of Artemis 3 and 5 human landing system providers with the help of our mentor, Dr. Kevin Crosby. Hello, I'm Angel Guerra and I'm from Mission, Texas. Hi, my name is Ruth Dixon Walker and I'm from Frisco, Texas. Hello, my name is Atul Anand from Bridgewater, New Jersey. Hi, I'm Varian Johnson and I'm from New York City, New York. My name is Noya Vainbrand and I'm from Austin, Texas. Hello, my name is Yair Villarubilas and I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Hi, my name is Enrique Perez de Leon and I'm from Dallas, Texas. My name is Caleb Beruman, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and thank you to Dr. Crosby and Model for their support through the project. We'll begin with describing Artemis and Gateway. Athul? Artemis's goal is to establish long-term presence on the moon, allowing us to achieve specific scientific goals, including collecting rock samples and analyzing water ice on the lunar surface. NASA has decided to outsource the design and construction of the Human Landing System, or HLS for short, a crucial component of Artemis to private companies. SpaceX was awarded a contract for their Starship HLS for Artemis 3 and 4. Blue Origin's Blue Moon HLS will fly on Artemis 5. The Lunar Gateway, another component of the Artemis program, is a space station that will be stationed in near rectilinear halo orbit to provide constant communication with the Earth and Moon. Trips to the lunar surface will also be cheaper and more sustainable with Gateway. Modules that constitute the Lunar Gateway will be delivered from ESA, NASA, JAXA, and the CSA. One of these modules is the Power and Propulsion Element, or PPE, which will contain the engines and refueling capacity for Gateway. Gateway will also have antennas that are capable of relaying high and low frequency X and KA bands to all lunar rovers, landers, and satellites. This image shows the concept of operations for Artemis 3. Stage 1 on the left is the launch of Starship HLS to low Earth orbit, or LEO for short, via the Super Heavy Booster. Then propellant tanks refuel the propellant depot in LEO, from which Starship HLS refuels in LEO. Shortly after, Starship HLS enters NRHO and docks with Orion. Starship descends to low lunar orbit, or LLO, before landing on the moon. After living on the moon for about a week, the two astronauts on the lunar surface will return to Starship and rendezvous with Orion in NRHO. Once the two astronauts disembark from Starship and reboard re Orion, Orion will perform an orbit departure burn. Orion will perform one more entry burn before entering Earth's atmosphere. Starship HOS will return to LEO and then descend to Earth along with Orion to be reused in future missions. The initial operation of Artemis V uses Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket to launch Lockheed Martin's CIS lunar transporter into LEO. The transporter is launched in two parts, a tug and a tanker. The tanker refuels the tug and then the two parts dock and launch into NRHO. In NRHO, the Blue Moon crew lander will dock with the transporter. The transporter will then refuel Blue Moon. Blue Moon combines with Gateway and awaits Orion. Once the crew transfers to the Blue Moon HLS, it will transfer to LLO and to leave the lunar surface. Upon leaving the moon, some of the Blue Moon HLS gets left behind with the descent stage and the rest of the space drive goes back to Gateway. At Gateway, the crew will redock, arrive, and come back to Earth. Blue Moon HLS and the Cis Lunar Transporter will also come back to Earth and be reusable for future missions. The goal of the first half of our project was to conduct a comparative analysis of four possible orbital trajectories for the Artemis missions to the Moon. Our goal was to find trajectories that allow the HLS rockets to get from LEO to the Moon and back with a propellant margin of 10%. This means that there is a 10% of propellant to provide a window for error for gauging the amount of propellant available as required by NASA because we just do not have the reliable means of gauging propellant accurately. We also varied cargo masses for each HLS to test how cargo mass affects propellant margin. Since both Blue Moon and Starship are supposed to carry up to 20,000 kilograms of cargo mass, we tested 10 different cargo masses in 2,000 kilogram intervals. We conducted our research using our mentor's Python code, which we altered. The code already included the delta V and transit time for trajectories based on the delta V map of the solar system created using the rocket equation. We added ballistic transfer, the ability to refuel an NRHO, and the ascent stage option for Blue Moon. We inputted the HLS spacecraft specific information seen in the middle left picture. We then mapped out our trajectory with the menu seen on the bottom left picture. The code produced a table including transit time, a graph of propellant consumption over time, and an assessment of mission success or failure. 
This is a table of the different parameters we inputted for each of the HLS spacecraft. As you can see, Blue Moon is smaller but it's supposed to have the same cargo carrying capabilities as the more powerful Starship. Additionally, not much information is available on Blue Moon, so we could not find the exact mass left behind on the lunar surface. So we assume this to be around 90% based on the Apollo missions. All trajectories to the moon require transfers between orbits. Each transfer necessitates a certain amount of delta-v or change of velocity to complete the maneuver. In order to visualize the delta-v requirements for the several possible trajectories NASA may take on the Artemis missions, I create a map. Starting from LEO on the left side of the slide, the four transfer orbits, TLI to NRHO, DRO, Ballistic, and TLI are labeled in blue, orange, red, and purple, respectively. Each orbit places the capsule on the moon, returns them to LEO via TLI, and these orbits will be expanded upon in the following slides. For the TLI to NRHO transfer, NASA plans to send the desired spacecraft to the moon via TLI or translunar injection into an orbit around the moon, a near rectilinear halo orbit, or NRHO. NRHO is a highly elliptical near polar orbit around the moon which uses the gravity well at Lagrange point 2 to stabilize itself and is at an inclination just below 90 degrees. Once NRHO, the spacecraft will then descend to low lunar orbit or LLO in preparation for a final descent to the moon. The spacecraft will then retrace its steps by returning to LLO, NRHO, and finally a return to TLI to ELEO. If the Blue Moon HLS were to take trajectory 1, the mission would only be successful meaning the 10% propellant margin if the craft took no cargo to the moon. Any mass added by cargo would cause the propellant margin to fall below 10%. This is largely due to the weak thrusters used to propel the craft, meaning that any kilogram of weight added burns more propellant than that of a more powerful craft. In stark contrast to Blue Moon, Starship never succeeds using this trajectory. However, the impact of cargo mass on the propellant efficiency of the craft is far less severe, with the propellant margin decreasing by about 0.06% per 2,000 kilograms. This trajectory should be avoided by Starship. The second trajectory starts from low Earth orbit and takes a low energy ballistic lunar transfer, or BLT, to NRHO, which saves delta V and has a relatively long transit time in comparison to a traditional translunar injection, which uses a high energy direct transfer. The BLT uses the gravitational pull of the sun to raise the apogee, or the highest point in the orbit, past the orbit of the moon. It then performs a lunar flyby, where the craft inserts itself into NRHO. From there, the craft lowers its orbit into a global low lunar orbit, or GLLO. The craft then lands on the lunar surface. The craft then returns to NRHO via GLLO from where the crew transfers to Orion and NRHO. From there, the HLS landing system transfers back to low Earth orbit from where it can return to the Earth to be reused. For trajectory two, Blue Moon fails the mission for every cargo mass tested, as the projected propellant margin after the mission is under the NASA requirement of 10%. The mission is still possible until the cargo mass reaches just under 12,000 kilograms because the propellant margin is greater than 0%. However, above that cargo mass threshold, the propellant margin becomes negative, meaning the mission fails due to a complete lack of propellant. If Starship takes trajectory two, it passes the mission for every cargo mass, as the propellant margin is well above the NASA requirement of 10%. While the mission saves a fair amount of propellants, the amount saved depends on factors including maneuver execution error and navigation accuracy. Overall, this trajectory presents the best option for Starship HLS, despite its added transit time and complexity. This is the third trajectory. Instead of a TLI directly to NRHO, the HLS systems would enter a distant retrograde orbit, or DRO, an orbit that relies on the Earth-Moon Lagrange points L1 and L2. We did this to see if such a trajectory could decrease transit time. TLI was not included in the trajectory description because in our code, a TLI was already included in the LEO to DRO transfer. Once the HLS enters NRHO, the rest of the trajectory stays true to the pre-existing Artemis trajectory plans. Trajectory 3 successfully closed the mission for Blue Moon, although the mission failed when the cargo mass was added. The Blue Moon rocket could reach LEO successfully with up to 12,000 kilograms of cargo, but the propellant margins with cargo was added are smaller than 10% and therefore do not meet NASA requirements. This mission fails for Starship for all cargo masses due to the 10% PM requirement. Only with an accurate propellant gauging technology could the mission succeed for all cargo masses tested on, with a lower uh, propellant margin requirement. Trajectory 4 is the final proposed trajectory and takes a unique approach. In other trajectories, stopping and refueling at NRHO are deemed necessary both to and back from the moon. However, in trajectory 4, Blue Moon and Starship skip both designated stops to save fuel and time, instead of going from LEO, directly to global LLO, and bypassing NRHO. Unfortunately, this idea of skipping NRHO proved to be ineffectual. 
Out of all of the trajectories for Blue Moon, Trajectory 4 is the only trajectory to fail without cargo by more than half a percentage and the only trajectory to result in a negative percentage for every cargo mass. Not only does this fail to meet NASA requirements, but the drastic negative percentages signify that this trajectory is impossible to complete, even if we ignore the 10% propeller margin. This same effect can be observed on Starship as, as well. Although this trajectory proved impossible, it further emphasizes the importance of NRHO for any trajectory or a mission to the moon, as without it, spacecraft cannot reach the moon. The left-hand graph records the transit time and days for each trajectory. Since both options don't carry humans for trajectories 1 through 3, the transit time to NRHO is irrelevant, since humans aren't on board. The right-hand graph shows the transit time for each trajectory with humans. Trajectories 1 through 3 have the same transit time with humans since they're only going from NRHO to the lunar surface. However, in trajectory 4, the transit time is 3 days longer with humans on board than for other trajectories since it skips the docking with Orion in NRHO and instead takes a high energy fast transfer to glow global low lunar orbit and the lunar surface. If cargo and humans had to be delivered to NRHO or the lunar surface quickly, trajectory 3 would be the best as it minimizes human time on board the HLS and has the least total transit time. In conclusion, due to the complexity of the Artemis missions, it is crucial to find a balance between efficient propellant usage, cargo mass, and transit time. For Blue Moon, this will achieve in trajectories 1 and 3 with both orbits achieving the necessary propellant margin with relatively short transit times. However, this comes at the cost of limited cargo carrying capability, an issue that should be addressed by Blue Origin. By contrast, Starship has a high cargo carrying capability and only suffers due to its low propellant margins with the exception of trajectory 2. NRHO refueling is a simple fix to this, and without it, any viable trajectory taken by Starship may result in a one-way trip to the moon. We also looked at refueling the Lunar Gateway, inspired by our mentor, Dr. Crosby's research. Due to the unusual behavior of liquids in microgravity, refueling architecture is more complex in space. Propellant has been a major limiting factor of payload capacity for launch systems due to the large amount of space and weight that propellant tanks consume, making in-space refueling essential. On Gateway, the PPE relies on xenon for its engines. These will be used for attitude control and must be refueled about twice in its lifetime. The vessel in which the xenon is stored can be observed through this diagram. Xenon is refueled through the xenon transfer system, which utilizes a pressure differential to refill tanks, a process known as blowdown. However, problems arise when gas bubbles move into the receiving tank during propellant transfer. There are challenges posed by refueling in microgravity as opposed to Earth's gravity. In a microgravity environment, the force of adhesion dominates, meaning that the propellant will cling to the walls of the tank rather than settling at the bottom. This creates a bubble at the center of the tank, called an ullage, only allowing the tank to be partially filled. This phenomenon occurs in the xenon tank on the PPE, meaning a better architecture should be found to minimize ullage formation. This video models the distribution of propellant in a fuel tank in microgravity. Red areas represent fast-moving fluid, while blue areas are slower moving. As the liquid settles, it sticks to the walls of the tank due to capillary action. To separate pressure and gas from liquid propellant and ensure that only liquid flows out of the tank outlet, propellant management devices, or PMDs, are used. One example of a PMD used in the tank design for the PPE is a vein, as seen in the bottom left image. Veins are thin metal plates along the edges of a tank that are shaped to take advantage of adhesive capillary forces, which cause the propellant to crawl along these plates and collect in the angles between the plates and the tank walls. This PMD is cost-effective and lightweight, but does not target ullage formation directly, preventing them from being used standalone. Sponges, which can be seen in the right two images, are similar to veins, but their position in the tank is different. They are perforated contoured metal sheets in a circular pattern around the tank outlets to control propellant movement. However, sponges are quite heavy. Although sponges that use perforation are lighter, they're often less efficient at controlling propellant movement. Like veins, they consist of no enclosures, but they are more densely structured. Bladder and diaphragm designs are another option for a refuelable tank. A bladder tank, as seen on the left, consists of an inflatable container housed in a rigid, pressurized cell. As pro propellant flows into the bladder, pressure and is vented from the shell to maintain a constant pressure in the tank. A diaphragm, shown by the diagram on the right, keeps the propellant and pressure in separate hemispheres. As the propellant is refueled, the diaphragm is pushed into the pressure and hemisphere, and as it empties, the diaphragm is pushed back. This allows for a constant pressure to be maintained and for accurate gauging of the propellant remaining based on where the diaphragm is. A solution we propose is to maximize surface area within the tank to increase the amount of propellant that can be captured by capillary action. At the same time, 
This slows the progression of propellant towards the pressurant valve, allowing more pressurant to be vented before the propellant reaches the valve. Our design consists of a honeycomb type structure throughout the tank as shown in the diagram. In tubes of small enough diameters, liquid behaves similarly in gravity and microgravity environments, meaning an ullage doesn't form. This is supported by the fact that there seems to be little increased of risk of gas bubbles forming in blood vessels in microgravity. Based on this, the walls of the honeycomb should be a maximum of a centimeter apart. This, the main disadvantage is that the honeycomb structure could add significant mass to the tank. Because of this, a material used for the structure should be the thinnest and lightest possible material that is still structurally rigid, non-porous, and non-reactive. We propose the aluminum alloy 6063 for this purpose, given that it is light, weldable, unreactive, and high in tensile strength. Another group of PMDs are screen channel liquid acquisition devices, which utilize direct flow paths from the source to the tank outlet to facilitate the flow of propellant. This type of PMD can be divided into two main categories, start baskets and total communication devices. Start baskets are small modules that surround tank outlets to hold propellant near the tank outlet. Total communication devices allow for propellant management across the entire flight time. They consist of a network of channels along the tank walls. The channels have one side with the porous barrier and two sides with solid metal plates. The porous barrier allows propellant to enter the channel but blocks large gas bubbles. A pressure differential between the outside and the inside of the channels pushes the propellant through the barrier. Screen channel LEDs are a very customizable PMD, as the geometry of the channels and the type of porous barrier used can be changed to meet mission needs. Lightweight materials can be used for the channel structure to minimize the weight of this PMD. Due to the extensive process involving the designing components for Gateway, NASA is reluctant to change the current tank design, which is difficult to refuel. However, for future refuelable missions, other tank designs should be considered, such as the ones outlined in our presentation. Additionally, NASA should consider a wider range of PMDs and use them in conjunction in order to maximize propellant management and prevent ullage formation. Although veins and sponges are used by PPE on Gateway, NASA should invest more time in researching more complex PMDs, like screen channel LEDs, in order to maximize efficiency during refueling. Seeds had many highlights. Challenging yet rewarding work puts us to our limits, but we always had our amazing and knowledgeable mentor, Dr. Crosby, and each other to rely on. Each activity brought us so much fun, but more importantly, brought our team closer together. The workload led to the challenge of overwhelming sleepiness, but on the whole, our experiences have been extremely positive and, our de and the benefits are definitely worth sacrificing a few hours of sleep. My favorite part throughout SEAS has been our lectures that are filled with innovative ideas about real-world science applications. I am very grateful for the opportunities that SEAS has provided me. I now know for sure that I want to go into the aerospace industry, and I have made some lifelong connections. SEAS has provided me with a fantastic opportunity to get acquainted with the rigors of being an aerospace engineer and allow me to meet phenomenal, like-minded people I would have never met without this program. SEAS will forever hold significance to me as it held long working nights with the brilliant minds beside me and collaborative meetings to solve complications. I'm thankful for the opportunities SEAS has provided. I sent them from North Carolina, major opportunities like a Johnson Space Center tour or a mentor like Dr. Crosby isn't easily accessible. SEAS has made me eager about what's to come for space exploration, and I feel even more confident in venturing even further into the world of STEM. I feel so lucky to have had the opportunity to come to SEAS this summer. I've become so invested in the fascinating research I've been able to do that it doesn't even feel like work. My favorite part was with my mentor and team. They were some wonderful, amazing, and smart people whom I had an amazing experience with. With a special thanks to Margaret Baggio and Selena Miller, along with Laura Tomlin and the rest of the SEAS staff, this experience has been life-changing, and we have all grown as students, engineers, and researchers.